Welcome to the October 22nd, 2015 Huffington School Committee regular meeting. We opened at 6.30 and went into executive session um, to ratify the memorandum of understanding with the paraprofessionals and discuss strategy respect to, with respect to collective bargaining with the HTA. Now if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge Allegiance to the flag the United States of America, and, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> now, quickly run through the agenda. We don't have any recognitions tonight, so we will start with public comments. Then we'll go into the reports. We'll have a student council report, an ESBC report, um, We'll see if there are any liaison reports, um, the school committee chair report, and the superintendent report. And then we will go into new business where we'll vote to ratify the MOU with paraprofessionals in an open meeting. And then we will talk about the joint, um, sorry, then followed by joint capital project with the town in the amount of $72,810.56. And Although it's on the agenda, we will not be dealing with the capital budget recommendations today. And we'll go straight into old business. And we will talk about the school committee policy, IHBG, home education. Then we'll have a second opportunity for public comment and items by consensus. And then after items by consensus, we will go back into executive session to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel and review executive session minutes for release. And so is there anyone here for public comment? Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, be as quick as possible but um, I know one of the things you're talking about is the, the homeschool uh, home educator policy and um, I did a little bit of research and so on from last time to this time and brought some additional information that um, <clears throat> and a, a proposal to be um, considered so uh, rather than just trying to leave it to you to make things up I'm trying to be helpful and um, just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to come back and participate and uh, to give some comment I um, appreciate the, again the decision to delay the, the final um, um, vote I don't know if it's vote or what's the right word and that uh, we have at least a little bit of extra time to um, provide some information <clears throat> we definitely have a common goal to educate our children with a variety of different things and um, to give our children the love of learning and doing that in a variety of ways is one of the ways we can do that and um, being uh, unique to different individuals in different situations is also very helpful um, we also want to be part of the broader learning community and to promote intellectual development uh, creativity and inquiry in in a variety of different ways um, so i think there are a lot of common goals there um, <clears throat> one of the questions that i think came up last time was um, a question about the needs of the home education in the homeschool community and if I was to just list a couple of things that are the highest needs and kind of work from there um, certainly after school extra extra uh, extracurricular activities are one of the things because there are a lot of team sports activities that are hard to do with one or two or three people um, field trips and assemblies is something that has been uh, feedback that um, people have done in the past and gotten a lot out of um, and uh, some of those are uh, tremendously good experiences um, the arts band choir drama marching band orchestra all those kinds of different things um, would be one of the areas of need and uh, desire for some homeschool families um, a couple of folks brought up special needs activities like a, a speech therapy or handicapped students or uh, different things that may need some unique um, expertise that may be a need um, there are some things with college prep activities uh, we actually have an 18 year old that just graduated last year so we've been going through the learning about getting into colleges and all that process and um, that's a 
steep learning curve. So I think that's an area of need, whether it's an SAT prep or just college guidance services, connecting with the timing and, and all the things that it takes to get uh, into college. And um, college fairs, uh, I understand there are college fairs where um, college representatives come into the school. Being able to participate in that would be a, a wonderful opportunity. And other informational sessions, um, I know that's kind of a generic term, but uh, those are things that would be helpful. Um, from time to time, I think there are some online courses, to my understanding. Um, and, you know, a lot of homeschoolers utilize online courses or other uh, similar curriculum. And I would say to a lesser need, core courses, and uh, in a minute I'll, I'll define that because that can be a little bit squishy. And um, I put a statement in here, kind of the current situation, and this is from a, a compilation of talking to multiple different families, that access, I would say currently, has been sporadic sometimes difficult, sometimes not difficult, very inconsistent. And so part of it is just being able to be consistent to know what you're going to get and, and um, to know what's available, what's not available would be really helpful. I think probably on both sides, knowing what you need, what we need as a group and, and vice versa. And then um, <clears throat> I think we talked about some numbers of homeschoolers within the Hopkinton area, and it's not a huge need. So I know that's one side of the coin where it's not a huge need, so it's maybe not the, the squeakiest wheel on the, on the car. Um, but it, I will also tell you on the other side, homeschoolers in some cases go to great lengths to provide uh, more difficult um, school activities. So. Uh, my wife actually does things where we get a tutor and students together to do things like sciences with labs. Labs are not easy to do at home. Um, and bring in both the expertise and kind of the community activity to do labs and things of that nature. So um, while there may not have been as many requests over the last number of years, some of that's due to the unknown, some of that's due to the inconsistency and not quite, sh not quite being sure what to expect. And uh, there are definitely needs. Now, I, I don't know who's going to actually utilize it, if it's open or closed or whatever, but uh, I'm just trying to provide information here. Um, <clears throat> Can I just, I'm just going to interrupt yeah. you for a minute, because technically you only have three minutes, so I just want to make sure we, <laughs> trying to um, we are able to move our meeting along. Okay, so. I'll be, I've got two more small paragraphs and then okay. I have a handout. I just wanted okay. to remind you of sort of yeah. the time limit, because we didn't start that way, but Thank you. I didn't even think of that, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, can't, I think the, the core request is to have more of an open policy. It seemed like the, um, the draft was more of a closed policy, meaning closed during the daytime hours or the core school hours. And uh, it, was, it read to me like it was defining extracurricular as only those things after school. And uh, so uh, the request is to have something a little more open. Um, and there are a couple of different terms that can be used. I was going to kind of break it into three areas. Um, core curriculum, co-curricular or electives, and extracurricular. And if I was going to take these in order of kind of need, um, co-curricular or elective classes, the arts, uh, some of those things that are not um, directly, and I don't, it varies from school to school and state to state, but requirements, it's not the core requirements, the math, science, literature, um, history, those kind of things for graduation. So I, those are defined in many states as co-curricular. So you have the core curriculum, co-curricular, and extracurricular. Um, of the three of those, the core curricular is probably the least of the needs, but depending on the family, it's still a need that's there in all three of those areas. Um, and one of the things that I did, and I, can I do a handout? Mm -hmm. Or sure. pass something out? Um, I think I made enough copies. This is just a proposed uh, red line um, wording of the main section that talks about curricular, extracurricular, and so on, um, just for consideration. Um, I took this verbiage from a combination of state information, not necessarily Massachusetts, because I'm sure you're all familiar with Massachusetts. Um, I was pointed to Minnesota actually uses these three different terms. I found it interesting that um, I don't remember if it was 
I have Holliston's home education policy, and it states that um, home educated students may participate in school sponsored ex activities, comma, extracurricular activities, comma, and co curricula in which the student might be enrolled. So they use that co curricula uh, terminology in Holliston. And I also pulled the Ashland, um, and it states that home based program uh, may have public school activities of either curricular or extracurricular nature upon the approval of the superintendent. So these are some schools that are um, adjacent to Hopkinton. I don't, I, I don't know if you were able to look any of these up. I looked at Framingham. Theirs was a little, um, it, I don't have it right in front of me. Theirs was, I think, similar to what I had proposed, not with the co-curricular. And um, at the same time, I know from some of the families that we interact with that Framingham's pretty open to to the home education um, community. So I think that's what I had. I do have a couple of questions, but um, I don't know what's the best way to ask questions. So generally, we don't respond to your questions now, but if you want to throw them out there, maybe when we get to it, you'll hear some answers because we'll have your questions in mind. Okay. Um, unless it's going to take six more minutes. No. <laughs> if you could I just sort too. of rattle them off, and then yep. we'll They're have those in mind when we I talk think. about the policy. So. The, um, some of the questions, and the questions have to do with um, just some general points, but um, a general question of what percent of the school funds come from taxes versus state funding? Um, that's just a, a curiosity and potentially a, a talking point. Um, a general question, what are the main barriers in providing access, and is there anything that I or I representing the homeschool community could help potentially find solutions to and um, you know what can we do from our end to be helpful in the process and to make it easier for the school systems to allow access so those are just the general questions can we right. hear your name it's oh Joel Briner Joel Briner Briner B R I N E R Thank you so much. Okay, and sorry, I took more time than no, I No, no problem. Right. You put a lot of thought into this. And, and I was here the last time, and your it takes Your information is helpful. Okay. Thank you. And um, that's almost last on the agenda. It's a short agenda, though. I, w I wouldn't, okay. right? Okay. I mean, it's a okay. short okay. agenda. Know, so thank you. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else here for public comment? Okay. Um, Mr. Graziano, would you like to? Oh, actually, we have the student council report coming first. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? I'm Jack Cody. I am a senior at Hoffman High School, and I am the vice president of student council. And I'm here to bring you an update about what be what's been going on at the high school. We've had a lot of stuff going on. I might go over three minutes, but <laughs> a lot is going on. So we had our Be Free annual fall jam October second, but due to the rain, we had to move it inside. But it was still a very successful event. Um, capture a flag to Jack, unite. Jack, are you in Be Free? Yes, I am. Yeah, I thought yeah. you were. I love Be Free, yeah. yeah. I'm Be Free, so me and my band played. I played with my little brother who's a freshman now. That's neat. And can you remind the school committee what the purpose of Be Free is? So Be Free is to provide an area where substances and alcohol are just not present. Anybody can come and just hang out and enjoy the environment. We have a lot of freshmen this year, which is awesome. I think we have upwards of 50 people in our club this year, so I'm that very excited That is great. About that. And didn't you perform at the 300th? Yeah, no, I didn't perform at 300th, but I introduced a bunch of my friends' bands. There you go. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, Fuse yeah. performed, the Love Walls performed, so you should definitely check them out. Nice. Some good Thank stuff. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt your report. Oh, no, if you have any questions, definitely. Um, Unite put on Capture the Flag this year on October 15th, which was awesome. We had eight teams. Uh, Spirit Week and Pep Rally went very well. The seniors had Spirit Week, such as Business Day, America Day, um, stuff like that and then we had camo we all wore camo on last day and then the other team the other teams the other um classes had tiki day they also had america day they had a neon day when we had blackout day so it's kind of contrasting but it was yeah very didn't fun. you have hippie day or something oh yeah we had 60s day 60s. it was 60s equal rights and a hippie day i was so confused it was awesome i walked yeah. in and they were like hippies <laughs> just but, then, like, but then there was also like red white and blue day and oh, i yeah. and so i said what's going on and they said yes and I thought, what, what's the thing? Couldn't get the theme. But then someone said, well, seniors dress differently. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. So everybody yeah. had, like, picket signs with, like, end the war, like, <laughs> pieces here. Like, cool. it was awesome. 
That's great. Stuff like that. Um, today, <laughs> we had two representatives from Boston Children's Hospital come in to talk to us about the effects of marijuana and the psychological effects it causes the brain. Yeah. It's very interesting to hear all about that with our psych programs, how amazing yeah. they are. So it was cool to hear their side of it. Um, we had heart screenings done by the Live for Evan crew, and they screened students to see if anybody had any risk for cardiac factors, which was awesome. Um, college fairs, we had two college fairs. National Honor Society inductions were on September 29th, and 157 kids were inducted to the current members, which was awesome to see. Halloween is coming up, and we have Senior Halloween on Friday the 30th. So there's, we have a class group, and everybody's like posting all their stuff. Like some people are being basketball players. Me and my friends being the Beatles, we're gonna set up a little stage and have some music going. Um, MCAS scores are higher than ever. The golf team has won their TBL oh, title. I just slipped right by that. <laughs> right by. Yeah. Right by, you know. Really? Right by. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just on that note, though, and we're going to have an MCAS report at the next meeting, but yeah. not only are MCAS scores higher than ever, but, but the high school really needs to be congratulated on the numbers of students who have gone from proficient to advanced. The percent increase, which is something we've been talking about, we can look at proficient advanced as one number, but we've been asking to look at it separately, and the numbers of students that have gone from proficient to advanced in certain categories, like in, I w don't want to say the wrong number, but it's yeah. something like 12%. I mean, it's really great progress, and your teachers, everybody's super proud of the kids, but we have a lot to celebrate that we'll be sharing with the school committee at, in more than one sentence next week, next yeah, meeting. Yeah, just kind of like slip that in there. So, yeah, it's just scores good. are higher yeah, than that, ever. You know? That happens. That is too. off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's great to hear. Uh, the golf team won the TBL title, Yeah. and they were 17-1. and one. The cross-country teams, both girls and boys, went undefeated in their regular season meets. Um, and then moving forward, Powder Puff football is on November 20th, and the teams have just began practicing. So it's going to be a good rivalry between the juniors and the seniors this year. Um, Thanksgiving football game is home this year, so everybody should definitely come out to see it. It's on November 26th. And the TBL Cheerleading Championship is on October 29th. So where's that happening? I am not sure. Okay. Mike, where is it? At the Athletic here? Center. Yeah, here yeah. at the Athletic Center. It's home. At the nice. Center. Yeah. So. Um, so I would just like to compliment you and your classmates um, on a wonderful, wonderful spirit week. Uh, your principals were so proud of you. Um, I think it takes a lot to have fun, um, have a lot of fun and a lot of spirit, but still maintain control and not get out of control. And that there, there's a fine line there. And, and I just want to congratulate you and for you to share back at the school how proud all of your teachers and, and administrators are of all of you. Thank um, you very much. Yeah. Very important. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Can so. I ask what Powder Puff is? So Powder Puff is where <laughs> the even, junior girls. You did that girls, in my high school like no, I didn't 30 know years ago. Sorry. Powder Puff is <laughs> awesome. So the junior girls and the senior girls compete in a flag football tournament, and uh, everybody okay. comes out to see it. And it was brutal last year. It was good. So <laughs> it was good. Safety good measures have been increased. For it. <laughs> is, that is that fair to oh, say, yeah, Jack? Yeah. What, yeah. Say it again. Safety measures have been increased oh, for this year. The name doesn't really indicate the level of <laughs> like the intensity and there was, contact. There was that kind of thing. Yeah, there there were some broken bones and concussion last year. So there <laughs> what? Was, there was <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. Flag yeah. football. Yeah. Worse than a regular football team. Wow. Seriously. It's because yeah. there's no padding. There's no it's, helmet. You know, it's, just, yeah. it's like rugby, you know? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I would definitely recommend going the out to check that. Practices have started and yeah. secret plays are in development. Yeah. It's oh. absolutely. Oh, last fine. year it was an amazing, oh, right? Oh, last year secret was so play. good. Last, pay, last play was just ball. like. Oh my god. I don't know if I agree with it, but I'm not here to talk about that, so. Because <laughs> <laughs> the juniors didn't win last year, right? Yeah. They, the, seniors, the seniors always win. I think they have oh, a number well, against yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the juniors yeah. let them win. Yeah. Um, Seriously. Well, thank you for the explanation. <laughs> yeah. Well, last year they all had, like, slogans, so it was like, I can't think of one off the spot, but yeah. they had, like, little slogans. Lori's like, going to volunteer to ref Twitter. next year. Are you going to oh, be yeah. having your uh, Halloween costumes judged? Yes, we are. So in the athletic center during lunch block, I believe, we're all going to have a big judging. Last year, the trophies, Mike and I were talking about it, were just awesome. I don't I, know how they got the paint off. but I know. They were awesome. So, so that's on the 30th? That's on the 30th, yeah. Friday, yeah. At 7.30 is the judging. Oh, 7.30 is judging. Okay, I yeah. missed it last year. I will be there. Yeah, 7.30 is judging. I heard about judging, it afterwards. So. Yep. Yeah, so and talent shows now moved to December third, but I'll talk about that at least twice before then. You so. will. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll be back. So much to keep up with. I'm telling you, if it was just Seriously. the high school, right? Oh, Jack, yeah. thank so you for being here. Thank you very um, much we for really me. appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. It's a highlight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll see you guys later. I will.
Gotta hit the books. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> hey, Mr. Graziano, ESBC. So means it. We gotta change the order. I don't. Want I know. To that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have gone first. Yeah, seriously, I just seized that opportunity. Say awesome. Yes, Mike, it's my turn. Five times. Yeah. Um, oh, to get some try. excitement. So, so w the SBC report is very exciting He's because we awesome. are approaching next Monday's very special awesome. town meeting where we're seeking ratification of the proposal for the new school. So next Monday at 7 p.m. in the high school athletic center um, will be special town meeting. Again, a reminder that we require a two-thirds vote for approval at that town meeting as well as a majority approval at the ballot, which will be Monday, November 9th, um, which will in the middle school, polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, the focus primarily from the ESBC has been on communication and awareness for the, um, for the upcoming uh, special town meeting and ballot. We've done, I think, how many organizations? Eight, we met? 20, Eight, 22 was 22 the latest number. Organizations that we've met with in addition to running a public forum, several open um, office hours at Waterfresh Farm, um, really just providing people with any and every opportunity that we could um, to have their questions answered and be aware of the process. We're also getting communications out through a, a whole slew of channels um, to make sure that people are aware that this vote is happening um, and that they need to be there. Um, free babysitting is available at the event on the 26th at the special town meeting. Um, there will also be, for those who can't take advantage of the babysitting because their children are too young to even take advantage of the babysitting, there will be a, uh, what we're dubbing a crying room, um, where people can be with their young ones and will be broadcast closed circuit TV into that room and a town official will be coming to count the votes in that room as well. So really trying to make it as easy as possible for people to attend because we know that it is a significant, um, it can be a significant thing to have, you know, to get babysitting, etc. So Monday, October 26th, um, this Monday, 7 p.m. in the High School Athletic Center. Um, the other highlight from this week is, um, as per usual town meeting procedure, um, the Appropriation Committee and Capital Improvement Committee reviewed the article for special town meeting and both committees voted um, their approval and endorsement of the project. So the motion from the Appropriation Committee at Special Town Meeting will be to approve the appropriation. Um, a number of the different committees throughout town have, have taken formal votes to um, endorse the article for Special Town Meeting. And so I wanted to suggest tonight um, if there was a desire to that it might be a good idea for us also to take a vote to endorse it, which would not only be a good sign of support for it, obviously, but also allow us if questions come up um, during special town meeting that as a committee we have a registered stance on the article. Is anybody opposed to us making a motion or taking a vote to endorse the article? That's a good no. idea. Okay. I would seek a motion to endorse the warrant. Or Warren Article Number One. Uh, okay. I'll I'll move that the school committee endorse Warren Article Number One on the special town meeting warrant for October 26th to um, appropriate funds to build the new elementary school located on Hayden Row. Se second. Motion by Mr. Graziano. Second by Ms. Birchman. All those in favor? Yes. 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 yes unanimous. And so carries. Thank you, Mr. Graziano. Are there any other liaison reports? Um, I just have one. The, um, the Director of Youth and Family Services is facilitating a, pre a presentation on the following night, October 27th, Tuesday, October 27th at 7 o'clock in the high school library um, related to opioids. So that will actually be a really great presentation and as much as we like to believe otherwise we do have um, that issue in our community as does every community so uh, it will be a really good presentation so I encourage all of you to come. Is it geared towards parents or, yes, or parents. students? Just parents. I also have a report so um, we the, it's now called CPAC. CPAC met this Tuesday and they also met two weeks ago for their meet and greet 
the meet and greet was actually not as widely attended as some of the prior meetings have been and I don't know if that's because they already felt they had met Dr. Zaleski but it was a very intimate meeting with actually a couple new people who got to meet her and we got to hear more of her um, just her thoughts on where where the district needs to go this year and what her current workload and planning is um, which was very helpful and then this past Tuesday's meeting was a normal CPAC meeting. They did vote to change the name from Speak to CPAC <laughs> because every other community refers to themselves as CPAC. So um, they're now in line with all the other communities. There was um, a lot of discussion around um, the Friends of CPAC and uh, HPTA working together to provide funding for paraprofessional staff to be at extracurricular activities at the high school and the middle school levels because there um, has been a need and students with special needs have, or parents and students with special needs children have felt that there wasn't the opportunity for them to partake because of the fact that they may need that extra support. So they're looking at um, funding sources from those two groups in order to try and get some paraprofessional staff in for various extracurricular activities and, and open up the access. Um, so that was a large part of the meeting. As well as Dr. McLeod presented on the new school building and there was a lot of great questions during the presentation. Um, and a lot of the parents in the room have students that are well beyond the, the years for the new school but were very excited about it and very excited about the community use for the building as well. So that's all I have. I don't have anything to report um, with respect to communications that I've received during since the last meeting. I received maybe one additional communication related to the student attendance policy, which I believe we've decided we're not going to revise and take up this mm -hmm. year. And I've not received any additional communications actually since our last meeting discussing the home education policy. Okay. But I mean, so I just I figured, right, I'm just going to report on communications, but I don't have anything else. So Dr. McLeod, your report? Yes, I'll begin with a couple of recognitions. Uh, so this month is National Principals Month, and you may recall that last year at this time I had the principals oh, yes. attend the meeting along with some students from each school to recognize their principals, <clears throat> and it was really heartwarming. Um, to hear what the, what the children had to say about their principals and um, how much they care about them. Um, but in, in thinking about it this year, first of all, I didn't want to do the same thing two, two years in a row. And, and secondly, it's another night out, and it's another and really needing to respect the numbers of nights out for principals. I really decided that I would recognize them in this way by, by just, not just, by, by thanking them publicly at this meeting and by recognizing that Without the principals, um, the programs that we that we have in our schools and the work that they do to bring the programs in um, would not be in place. I mean, the teachers are the ones that put the programs in place, and they're the ones that provide the education. Absolutely, um, but the principals are working really hard right now, going through looking at all of their programs and preparing budgets to bring to our office. Um, that will meet the needs of the kids that are right in front of them and meet them in the best way. And I listened to a couple of conversations today because I was observing at the high school, and it's just so impressive. Um, and I know that those same conversations are happening across the district. In addition, the fact that you all send your kids knowing that the, the safety of your children is paramount is because of our principals. They are there. They're their primary purpose, not their primary purpose, but their primary focus every day is safety and security. And along with, obviously, um, Mr. Powers, our SRO, um, I just want to thank them for that. I want to thank them for their passion, for their dedication, um, and for their excellence, because we, we are very fortunate to have the leadership that we have in this district. So thank you, any of you that are watching. Um, I also wanted to recognize that last night, was the official ribbon cutting for the courtyard. John, do you want to say anything about how that was last night? It was a great event. I mean, we've had the, the good fortune because we do meet here to see it kind of progress throughout the entire um, process. Although I spoke to Chip Baker, who did the landscaping back there, and I wish I had been here when they were doing that because it sounds like there were some fun 
uh, pieces of heavy equipment to get those oh, stones oh, over yeah. the roof. Um, but it was a great event. Um, you could tell the, I mean, Mrs. Grady, every time she comes here, we see the passion that she has for this project, but all the people who were involved, you could see the excitement and the passion um, that they had for the project. It's it, it's a gorgeous space that's only going to continue to get better uh, for the students, yep. so it was uh, it was happy to be a part of it. It was a, it was a great and well-attended event. And for the sake of the camera, that door right there leads out to the courtyard, correct? Yes. As well as a few others, but um, there, there it is, right back in there. I, I had asked if we could have some lights on tonight, but not yet. There's no lighting out there quite <laughs> they yet. They promised that that's coming They next. need to raise yes. a little bit more money. Okay, <laughs> lighting, right. Um, so I want to focus my comments tonight in my report on enrollment. Um, enrollments and also uh, I'd like to address some comments um, specifically related to the article that was written, written recently released um, regarding potential concerns about capacity. And I think it's, it's resulted in some concerns um, in the community. So I wanted to address them tonight um, in, in my report and then also um, obviously we'll be taking any questions related to this on Monday night at the, at the um, special town meeting. So first of all, you have the enrollments in front of you. And what I think, you know, when, when I look at this article that was written and I look at some of the quotes um, that were said in terms of our, our current numbers, um, I did give you the information in, in, without knowing completely what the, what the results were. We were, either, we, we were really just talking about how many students had registered between June and September mm -hmm. and the impact that it had on certain grade levels. Um, but tonight I have the overall numbers in front of us and, and that's not unusual because we always have to wait for October 1 enrollment as well as the numbers of students who are in private schools and charter schools, etc. So when we look at those numbers and the ins and the outs and, the, and some of it predictable and some of it not, um, the net overall difference between actual enrollment today as of October 1 versus uh, last year is actually a net of minus three in terms of the difference. So although in fact, yes, there were 130 students, the word is unexpected in here, we always expect kids over the summer, um, I think what is very true and what we talked about at that meeting is that we do need to continue to monitor carefully capacity and that is exactly what we're doing. Um, in looking at our numbers, we are, NESDEC is not that far off. Um, NESDEC pr provided us with additional um, research when provided with the additional planning and additional um, development that was taking place in town. They went back and reworked their numbers. And so when we compare our overalls with NESDEC, um, we are feeling confident that the numbers that have been giving us been given to us right now for what we know today and over the next five to ten years, uh, five years I'm going to say, um, are, are pretty consistent with what we're seeing. As always, however, we have to stay vigilant. We have to be watching developments. We have to be watching what the impact is on our schools and continue to talk about areas where there may or may not be concerns. Capacity mainly means that we have room to educate every student who comes to our doors in the best way that we can. And as you've seen at Center School, we've made some decisions there in order to provide a program that we knew was very important and have all of the children receiving that program in that building. So are we beyond capacity? Absolutely, at Center School. But are we educating all of the children that come to our doors effectively? Yes. So there's, there's two different ways of looking at that. Um, any questions about enrollment on, in terms of this spreadsheet? Um, so I, I didn't have any questions, though. I, I did. I picked up on the same thing in the article you did, which is I like the characterization of 130 unexpected right. enrollments as if we right. don't expect anyone to move in over the summer. Right. Um, and, and I do also, I, I, I would, did want to comment that I don't think there's anybody who sort of beat NASDAQ over the head harder than, than I did about their projections and et cetera. And they did go back and rework them. And this year's number was within five tenths of a percent. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, it, I think, is a number we can feel pretty good about from a predictive model. Um, and that, um, y you know, the, the, the things that we've heard about the school are, you know, trying to match up the enrollment number 
the design enrollment number with the enroll actual enrollment numbers we have at K and one this year. And I want to continue to just reiterate, as I'm sure we'll reiterate on, on Monday night, that mm -hmm. the design enrollment we had for the new school was a guideline number and not to say we're building a school to hold exactly this many children. Mm -hmm. And we are confident based on the number of classrooms and flex space that we have that we can accommodate not only the students, the, the size classes that we have right now, but also growth in the future. So, um, right. That's something that I know that I, I've heard since that yes. article came out, and I just want to stress again that it's not it, it, we we have we are we are confident that the school is going to be able to accommodate not only the the current projections but also potential growth. Thank you. And so that's the second handout that I gave you tonight. So it's a after enrollments, and it's a n nice little chart. Um, and this is what I'm going to be prepared to talk about at Special Town Meeting as well. So I want to begin by making a statement that we have been and always will and will continue to be closely tracking and monitoring space in our buildings. Uh, I gave you a report a year ago in terms of how much room do we have at that time. We were looking to move the preschool into a space and we found that there was room at Elmwood. Um, we are confident, I am confident, that we have enough flexibility in design to accommodate our growing population once the new school is open. I'm going to talk about that in more detail. Um, this then will have a direct impact on the capacity at the Elmwood School because preschool will be moving out of there and provide, when I talked about class size in third grade, um, that's a bubble this year. But as we continue to look at movement out of Center School into Elmwood School, we'll have additional space there. Um, and then I also want people to really understand that when we were designing this building, we were work working with the MSBA around a formula that, that they support a project as close to the needs as possible. So they're not going to support a project that doesn't have specific data behind it. And we had to work within the data that we had with the projects that had been approved at the time, or they simply are not going to work with us. So what they said to us in one of those meetings was, we, do, we will not support a building that is going to have empty classrooms. And so we need to work with you to design a building that will be full, and yet build a little bit of flexibility into it. So what this chart is um, demonstrating for you is that what we currently have in our kindergarten classroom is 207 students. NESDEC uh, predicted 180, which is 27 students less than what we currently have. But there's a pattern that comes here. So we believe that the reason we have that additional number is, is more to do with full day kindergarten and students who came to us that would have been in a private setting than it does that NESDEC was off. Um, currently, we have 239 students in first grade. NESDEC predicted 248, which is nine less than what we currently have. When you look at um, their projections then to the right for the opening of school in 2018-19, they're predicting that we will have 178 kindergarten students. If we do, that means 10 classes with 17 students in each class. What that means in terms of growth capacity is that if we were to have a class of 20, that means we have room for three additional students in each of those 10 classes. We have room at the opening of that building for 30 additional kindergarten class to come to us, and we still have two classrooms that we're not, two classrooms that we could use. One empty kindergarten classroom and one swing space. So there is at least room for, at the opening of that building, 50 additional to kindergarten students. At first grade, if we stick with that projection, and that's all we have to work with right now, we would have 221 students, which would be an average of, because we don't want to go over 20, 11 classes of 20 students. You'll see in the right-hand column that I didn't build in any room for additional students because 20 is, is the number that we wouldn't want to go beyond. But if we got more students than we were expecting, there is a flex space. And the flex space is meant to be used in that way, only for the years in which we need them. Um, that because we know that there will be ebbs and flows to different grade levels. So to illustrate that point, if you go down on this chart to the next projection, with this 2019-20, you'll see the same kind of pattern. We have 10 more kindergarten students we can still only have 10 classes, which gives us some flexibility. 
we could also potentially have that bigger first grade take over one of those kindergarten spaces. So there's some room there. Um, and in, but we are, instead of 221 first graders, we're looking at 205 first graders, which makes sense because it's coming out of the previous kindergarten. Um, mm -hmm. You can see flexibility all the way along, but I'm also demonstrating in this chart that it changes that 10 to 11 classrooms. We have 11 classrooms of each in the building and a flex space, both one upstairs and one downstairs. So we, we have room for 12 classrooms. And what I want to demonstrate in terms of my confidence is that um, we can maintain and have enough, enough flexibility in the design footprint of the building that we're going to be opening in 2018. Um, to allow significant flexibility and still maintain class size in the way in which we have planned it. Questions? That's reassuring. So. Um, and, and actually, Kelly, thank you because um, I have become aware of some concerns, not directly, in fact, which, as you all know, is always a concern of mine when people don't bring their questions directly, but I, I do know that there have been concerns circulating in the community about the building not being big enough to house our, our children. Um, and so if there's any questions that, you know, even at, if this would be a time when you want to ask them publicly um, in response to this report, are there others out there that would be, that are not answered by, by the information I just provided? Well, that any that of you have heard? I know that it came up during the CPAC meeting that people wanted to know that there was room for expansion and oh, yeah. we were able to talk about the fact that the way the building's been designed that there's r the ability for additions to be added to the building as well as the fact that there's land appropriate for that. Yeah. Um, so that was, I mean, and that's obviously worst case scenario versus what using what's already there. Yeah. But people wanted to know that that existed and that that was planned for so that if you needed to do that, it could happen. And Thank you for that, because one of the things I learned, and I don't know if I was the only one that learned this, but then this is the first time I've gone through working with the MSBA, was that we were not allowed to design a building that then recommended that the town pay for one wing. Right. They were not going to work with us in that capacity. They would work with us in this capacity, and then down the road, if it, if it turned out that based on what happens in our community over the next number of years, we needed to build on, we could then, as a town, build on a wing. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't going to be, well, they'll, they'll build you know, this part with us and then we'll take on this additional wing. Um, so I feel really confident that when we did go back to them and we did ask to, for, for them to recertify, and I, you know, that's probably not common knowledge that we did go back and say, even if this building project doesn't go forward on schedule, we are not comfortable with the current enrollment certification for this very reason. We did not want to be opening a building that could not house the children, and we were very concerned about that in terms of what we were provided. And it's, it's coming to fruition because, in fact, it would not have been big enough. So we have been worried about that all along and working within the constraints of their guidelines to make sure that we could work with the MSBA um, and be able to get their support. And I think it's, it's worth noting, too, that what you just outlined is that I, I understand, I mean, we all witness the growth in town, and we, we all see it, but even this idea of if we wanted to build an additional wing of classrooms, there's no empirical evidence to support the idea that we need more than the 11 classrooms there plus isn't. the two flex, the no. 22 classrooms plus the two flex spaces. There's not. And so it's, it, it's you know, it, it, we, we're, we're monitoring this, as you said, and we are, yep. um, you know, we'll, we'll monitor it every year, but I think it's important that we're, we're working with the data that we have and we feel very comfortable that we are solving the problem in the most effective and long-term way. And John, thank you for saying that because this is a piece of the pie, right? Our very big pie. Our pie is five schools. Right. And the children that are moving to the district, as we're seeing from these projections, are coming at all grade levels. Right. So as we build developments, children are, you know, they're not only coming into the community at KN1. Um, and that's a really important point when we look at the building project that's being designed for for the early childhood students. The other buildings are also, you know, we're, we're getting kids coming in at every grade level. I mean, not everybody obviously has all the, I mean, this is all going to be in the, the packet and it's publicly available, but the two grades that actually had the, the largest number of move-ins were 
well, the the first grade, it's but that's in, the yeah. kindergarten factor, but also the 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 second into third grade and yep. the actually junior into senior. Yep. Were the two grades that had the the most move-ins. So right. it's not we're not just getting all it, not everybody's moving in with the kindergarten. No. Nope. Grade is 36 kids. But then look at what happened no, in fourth and sixth. The, that's grade level difference though. That's mm -hmm, from last right? year seventh grade. So we have a so significant it's, it's, decrease in fourth grade and in sixth seventh, grade. It's actually a. So but this was not in the packet. Will we post it? This was not. No. No. Oh, the enrollment projections weren't. This will be posted. Yes. yes, we will absolutely make sure this gets posted. I think there's some. You know, I've seen some concern as well in the community about the new um, apartment complex that's planned for Lumber mm -hmm. Street. And I think it's important to note that that is information that NESDEC does have. That's all part of the conversation yes. that we had with them last year when they went through their recalculation mm -hmm. um, of, our, of our enrollment projections. And so, I mean, I think you asked earlier what other questions are we hearing. That would yes. probably be the only other one that, that I'm... The specific one that I'm hearing is, did, you know, does it does that take account of of those um, of those apartments? And it does, and we all know that that probably is. While there may be a predictable number, the needs of the students that are coming from those apartments may may cause there'll be variations in our operating budget do, for all of this because of what grade levels they're at, what their particular needs are. Mm -hmm. So um, so the idea that any of this is a surprise or different is kind of surprise. I mean, this is a conversation that we've always had every year mm -hmm. um, and is one of the main functions mm -hmm. of our job. So I, I, I just, I think the article painted a picture that, w you know, <laughs> we were caught by surprise and, and we really weren't. Mm -hmm. um, so just to reassure people that this is something that we close, we track really carefully. And I think, for me, what I think is going to be really important to watch, because I think it will change. Um, you know, I can't construct their mathematical formula that they use at NASDAQ. It's really complicated. But a certain period of years is going to have to go by where we have full day K till that fully kicks into their projections. You're, you're so much more mathy than I am. So <laughs> I think we're going to continue to see, a, you know, some people are going to consider a surprise of the full decay. It isn't because we're planning on that, but it's going to look larger than what they're predicting for a while. For a while. Because we've implemented full decay and, and their look back period. I don't know. Yeah, That's there's nothing sort of mathematically they can do to like add 20 because we have full day K exactly, to the projection. Right. So yeah, so, we need some experience. So yeah. I think that just going forward, that's going to be off for a couple of years mm -hmm. until their yeah. okay. look back look, catches up with that kind of. But so I, <coughs> sorry, I am losing my voice tonight. But um, I haven't read the article. I knew the article was coming, um, and I somewhat knew the tenor. I, I don't know who was quoted, so because I have not read it, but. I think it's interesting if I'm understanding what everyone's talking about in terms of the tenor of it that this conversation about enrollment comes up at least once a month in our meetings because of the fact that we budget discussions is based on enrollment, programs that are important to the various schools is based on enrollment. All those discussions happen throughout the year. So it's very misinformed to assume that it was a surprise to anyone on the committee because of the fact or you for that matter because of the fact that it comes up in almost all of our discussions about budget. So I, so I, I think for the maybe the community member that's not necessarily following the meetings as closely as obviously all of we, you know, all of we are, um, may be surprised, but that's where I'm a little confused as mm -hmm. to where the mm -hmm. tenor of the article came from, so. Okay. It's worth noting that the majority of the quotes in that article were actually, the article that was written this week were taken directly from our September 10th meeting. Ah. So, goes to your point. This is something we talk about a lot. Okay. Okay. Thank okay, you. on to new business. So, we'll, um, I would seek a motion to, um, basically we're going to replicate what we did in executive session. So, a motion to approve the vote to ratify the MOU with the paraprofessionals. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Knight. And we'll take a roll call as we did. Um, Ms. Birchman? Yes. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Ms. Knight? Yes. And 
I am a yes, and, and I have to abstain. Ms. Nickerson abstains. Moving on to the joint capital project with the town in the amount of $72,810.56. Um, for our consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to pay this capital project as appropriated in Article 23. There's a motion uh, before you on the agenda. Is there any discussion or about the motion as presented in the agenda materials? Nope. So would someone like to make a motion to approve the payment of $72,810.56 to, sorry, the um, Carousel Industries, invoice number 1680645 in the amount of 400, this is how we do it, right? We go through each vendor? You to say. Okay. Indicated. All right. So. Let's go back. So, um, for the payment of $72,810.56 to the vendors as indicated in the request for payment joint capital form. So moved. Seconded. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so carries. We're not going to um, review the capital budget recommendations tonight. We'll move that to our first meeting in. November. Okay. And so we're moving on to old business. School committee policy IHBG, home education. This is our third reading. And for consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to provide um, the additional definition of extracurricular that the original policy was adopted in December of 2007. It's been shared through the listserv. And um, as we heard tonight and at our previous meetings, we've received a lot of feedback from the public. Right now, we have a motion on the agenda to move to adopt the policy as it was shared in the listserv and as it's presented in the materials and as it's been amended. Is there any discussion on the motion itself? I'm happy to make a comment. Sure. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to thank Mr. Briner for coming a second time. Um, clearly, um, you know, his comments about sharing a love of learning, um, in, you know, giving kids opportunity for creativity, inquiry, there is no doubt about all of those things that he said. What's interesting, and this has been very tricky and very challenging, and this is why it's still on, it's, this is not an easy decision. Um, what I come back to in thinking about my recommendation is that, as with most of our policies, they provide clear boundaries and guidance for all of us in terms of how we do our business. It, in, in case of this one, it provides clear boundaries and guidance for principals. Um, we, I've worked with administration and with families to clarify the definition of extracurricular for the very reason, um, one of the things that Mr. Briner commented on was the sporadic access that's been in all of our buildings. And that's how we originally and initially took up this policy, because it wasn't consistent. And what we learned in looking at it was that the reason it wasn't consistent is that people weren't referencing it. And it was being left to individual principals to make decisions, or even in the case that was first brought to our attention, individual teachers for all the right reasons, making decisions about access to programs, but on an individual basis. And I think that's where we get into trouble. So it's back on. I, I think that it's really important to, to define extracurricular. I think that we could certainly broaden the definition. I know that there have been a couple of comments um, to not keep that definition quite as tight. And I had your language here. But both, both two people um, in suggested broadening that language a little bit um, to include but not be limited to. Um, many of the things that Mr. Briner mentioned are included in the recommended motion. Um, open seats in virtual high school or TECA. Again, examples would include but not be limited to. School assemblies and enrichment opportunities, after school clubs. Um, he mentioned um, SAT prep and um, guidance parent information sessions. 
I took note of that because I feel that we could do a much better job at communicating with our home education, our homeschool parent group as a group. And we learned that through this process, mm -hmm. just in terms of having giving them separate mailings because they're not on listserv. So making sure that they're aware of these opportunities that are available to all parents to come to, for example, the one that stood out to me is was um, information sessions about college application. Right. And that's provided for parents. And there would be no reason why we wouldn't extend that invitation or make a better effort to communicate ongoing newsletters, for example. Um, provide access to listserv so that they can be aware of what's going on in the school's extracurricular activities. Um, I think that could be a real improvement that could come out of our work and the feedback that we receive from the community around, um, you know, what are the things that, that they need. Because I, I, I do um, want, in any way that I can, as a superintendent, to be aware of the needs of all students' educational needs in our community, whether they're in our schools or not. I do believe that the policy should provide direction so that we are consistent with, with the responses and that that's why I'm making the recommendation that I am. I also believe that there's enough um, flexibility in the definition that we can provide flexibility around what is considered, it says, as, as recommended, it says limited, include but not limited to. Um, and I think we could do a much better job at communicating those, the things that are going on in our buildings, both for students and for parents, that would really um, reach, make a better connection with our homeschool community. So that's my comment. Um, I know it's a difficult, difficult decision. So um, I, my motion remains. Can I just make sure I understand the, the motion or when we, if we move to approve mm -hmm. it as it appeared in the agenda materials, mm -hmm. where the would include but is not limited to it's at the top of the second page so if we look at the oh, sorry okay. so can I ask a question just as you were talking um, what I think is possibly missing is how do people get the permission to go to some of these things that are on the list do we yeah. have that in here and I'm not seeing it or do we need to so I think we get to this because they can't just show up at our buildings because we all know there's it's very challenging to get into the, I mean, you know, rightfully so, there's a yeah. lot of security to get through, so. Yeah. <clears throat> um. So, my response is gonna be a question, Jean, in that, it, does that become procedural? So, if we are, for example, procedural would be um, making a better effort to make, have better contact, you know, right. reaching out to homeschool, the homeschool community and, and giving them the opportunity or, or explaining how to, how to sign up for listserv, which we all know is not simple. Um, <laughs> and then once they have access to that information, it, it tells you how to sign up. Like if you're going to come to different events, there's okay. information there, then you contact the school, I'd like to be participating in this extracurricular or I'd like to go on that field trip, how do I go about getting my child included? And that would happen at the individual school. So maybe we can include something like that in procedure reference. So it sounds sure. like maybe what, what would be helpful would be to develop a little packet, essentially, to give to families when they register that they are homeschooling or whatever. They have to fill out paperwork with your office, right, to, to indicate yes. that they're... So if there's a little packet of information that tells them how to register for the listserv, which is how you get the parent newsletters and you find out about the college fairs and the um, the you know, junior college admission night. There, There is no SAT prep provided by the school. I think that was one of the requests. That's not... But parents could sign up for it, right? It's not provided, but don't students pay to take that? That's separate. I mean, they make those arrangements, but it's not a school. At any rate, so okay. whatever opportunities there are would be available th through all of those. So, so I think making a little packet available to them when they register or yep. inform you um, and noting that in here would be helpful and then as you say that's the appropriate place to tell them how if for example they want to go to the assembly on XYZ. So if I'm just getting this right it says procedure reference IHBGE1 so this would be IHBGE2? Yeah. I see. Some kind of a, a package that you would give them. Um, I think that uh, the list um, I mean, there definitely are, are things that we could add to the list. It does say not limited to, so I, I don't think we have to decide tonight what's a comprehensive list, but my only um, 
comment about the list is I think te TECA is the one that you enroll in full time, so I think actually that should not be on the list. It, tech has the online courses. Thank you. And we can take some through TECA, but I think that's a little confusing and you don't, mm -hmm. that's not what we're encouraging necessarily. Um, and I think if the language on the end at the bottom of the first page, if we read it together, extracurricular is defined as programs and activities that take place place outside of the regular school educational program. It doesn't say outside of the regular school day and I think that's important because this would include assemblies that take place during the day. It would include potentially enrichment activities that are available to students on an early release day. So it doesn't say after school hours and I think that's intentional. I agree but I do think that it's really important as we discussed before to make a distinction between you know art and music are not extracurricular subjects, and and we've done that here. But um, you know that I think originally there was some question that could those be considered extracurricular and could students participate in them? And I, I just think it bears repeating before we vote on this that you know the professional staff that's hired follows state frameworks, and it, it is not an it's not equivalent to an extracurricular class. It is. Um, well, it's co-curricular. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So can I respond? Because I looked up co-curricular because I hadn't heard the term before, and I did see that it was in Holliston's policy. And I actually, it says, experiences that complement what a students are learning in school. Ungraded, no academic credit, outside or after school. And then it's examples, and this is in, like, it was like ed definitions, so definitions that are particular to education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm newspaper, musical performances, art shows, mock trials, debate, etc. So they have access to, let's say they're doing art outside of school and the high school is going to have an art show, maybe they have an opportunity to have their material presented. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly, at least when I, because I, I hadn't heard the term co-curricular before, um, and then I did look, it is in Halston's policy, but it doesn't to me sound like it's very different from what we're already saying. Can you say that again? Ungraded. So it said ungraded, no academic credit outside credit. after school. Okay. And then it gave examples of newspaper, musical performance, okay. art shows, mock trials, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically how we are defining extracurricular. That's how we're defining yeah. extracurricular. So, um, you know, I, I agree and I thank you for putting a lot of thought into this. And I did look at Ashland and Ashland does say it, it includes the core curriculum. And I don't I think for various reasons, um, I think one of your questions was, you know, what are the barriers to access? And for me, I think of safety, and safety not only of the students that are coming every day that are enrolled, but safety of the students, um, depending on their age, but like to get into a classroom and to, to have their whereabouts known um, by the principals and just the tracking um, when t we don't know to expect them or not to expect them. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, for me, safety was always sort of the barrier that I thought of, but I'm, su I'm sure there are, there are others that if you, I mean, that was one of his specific questions. So I don't know if you've got other ideas or other reasons that support why there's a barrier. So the other barrier that comes to mind is the same, the comment that I made at the beginning, which is, is that it's inconsistent. It's sporadic. Um, the barrier is that we can't plan for it and that we have we don't know what to expect in one school over another and that that's a barrier because I, I it's it's um it's hard to plan for what you don't know and so and then can we answer the other question do we have that information which was um school funds that come no. from taxes versus state I don't percentage? have that tonight at the okay. tip of my do you know <laughs> no I didn't I mean yeah. great question vary by people's what they pay in tax. Yeah. That's probably right. I think it's a clear percentage. And well, so it's, per, it's per pupil as far as the right. student piece in terms of what comes in. Um, for so you could take what we spend per pupil. Could you take what we spend per pupil, which is a public, and like someone averages it out, it exists. It yeah, but I mean, you could also just look at the percentage of the budget. The percentage of the budget that you get from the state and the percentage of the budget that's from taxes. I mean, it's not. Yeah, we've got to, I mean, I'm trying to look quickly through history of 
mm -hmm. like the last budget presentation because we do I know we break down the revenue sources at some point but I don't I mean I want at least for me that's not the way I think that we're looking at this decision right. and it's and it's how we're making it mm -hmm. I think it has to do with consistency and policy with respect to the students who are enrolled um, and we're you know 100% responsible for versus students who families have made different decisions and for I, I just I, so I, I just I don't I don't think I ever thought about it with respect to the money um, so that's why I mean I, I didn't look at this answer and it doesn't really it wouldn't be the reason for my decision to say oh we don't get enough money for you so we can't no um, give you access I had taken some notes for from the last time just around different things I just wanted to ask about like nature's classroom the DC trip are those considered field trips so that would be something people are because they're kind of curricular but yeah. so I don't know how those so play in. it's gonna sound like I'm dodging that one and, and, and I, I feel like it, that is not that is something that would we would have to say I would fall under it would include but not be limited to I mean for me when you talk about safety that that one concerns me because that's that's an that's an overnight out of state field trip, mm -hmm. where we potentially might not know the student well at all, okay. um, and so that would have to be a conversation taken up um, okay. with a, a specific family over a specific situation within the school. Okay, um, I have some easier ones then: dances, drama productions. Mm -hmm. I think we've said those are yeses. Um, I know we had specifically talked about music groups, but being inside of a school day, that is a graded, you know, academic credit. I don't know if there are music groups. That, there's probably after school clubs that are musical. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, those are the ones that I just wanted to ask about. I don't think that the band or the chorus at the at the Hopkins school kid, kids get grades, but I could be wrong. Have you ever had kids yeah, and they, they get, get graded? A, yeah, they get graded. Not for their class, but for their once a once a week band opportunity where they all get together? Well, it's on the report card. Okay. So there's an assessment there. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I have struggled with this since the day we've taken it up because I struggle with being a district that's all-inclusive versus being a district that has to have policies that allow for the administration to be able to run a well oil machine that they are currently running um, and like you said have the ability to plan I the thing that bothers me about it is that if the families had chosen to send their students they'd have access to everything mm -hmm. so then it becomes a question of well does that then that's the decision, you know, the, the decision mm -hmm. then is that you don't get that same access. Um, but it's hard for me because knowing that there's other districts that have a more open policy than we do, it's like, well, how does that work? So I'm not asking that question. I'm just, mm -hmm. that's the thought process mm -hmm. that's gone through my head. Um, I, like you, Ellen, have not put it into a money perspective. It hasn't been a money perspective. It's been in my head. The safety has definitely been a, an issue. Um, the administrative burden on teachers and staff and and aides and the principals at the schools. Um, but at the same time, very well understanding what the parents said of come and talk to us about and what they're trying to do to enrich their children. Um, so I, I have to say, like, it's probably, it, I don't have a clear, a clear gut feel on it because it just, it feels like there, it feels like if there were other districts that were of the same mindset where they were saying that they couldn't manage it either. But the thing is, is that every district's different and every demographic's different. I think the definition that came out of Holliston's, not necessarily changing co changing it to co-curricular, but the not graded, whatever that criteria was, I think was probably the most helpful criteria I've heard yet. <laughs> Ungraded, no academic credit outside after school. Just strictly because I... Um, 
because I feel like that's where we fell down with this. Mm -hmm. Like you, you were right. It's not been consistently applied, but I don't also know that it was known how to be consistently applied. So that's where I feel like my job is mm. to come up with the tools to consistently apply it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do still have a very, I do still have a discomfort with having it limited. But yet the snowball effect, I feel, does exist in this case. And so that's where I, I, I feel like as long as we have a clear set of guidelines for both our principals and our administration to use consistently, then I at least will then feel comfortable that we're treating all families the same. I agree with that, but I think the, the very important piece that sounds like it's really been missing is making sure that that is very clear on the front end to the families for them to weigh as part of their decision-making process. And so, you know, um, it sounds like maybe the Holliston and Holliston policy isn't really apples to apples with ours. If they, it sounds like their definition of co-curricular is our definition of extracurricular. Whatever we can debate that for a while, but I think the important thing to me, and it, it's not going to, everybody isn't going to like exactly how it is. But as long as we're all very clear on how it is, and I think that's where the source, that's how all of this got started. Was there was just a a gap in understanding between all of the people involved and policy wasn't um, being applied the way that it should. So I think that um, as unfortunate as that circumstance has been, it's prompted a, a lot of really thoughtful conversation and review and people are now more on the same page about it. So I think what's important to me, again, is um, clearer communication to the families on the front end and more consistent application on our end of the policy by all of the buildings. Um, I think that that's, you know, only fair to everybody involved. Um, and so I think, you know, a little packet or even if, if the principals can get a list at the beginning of the year of these are the students that are at your grade level that are being homeschooled, you know, please just reach out to the families and let them know how to contact you or what opportunities their, their students might want to partake in. You know, just a simple communication at the beginning of the year maybe could, um, mm -hmm. could open some doors. And then, you know, as we go along, we may find that there's some uh, fixes that, or adjustments that need to be made. So I just want to be clear in case everyone goes to the Holliston policy. The Holliston policy uses the word co-curricular, and then I looked up the word co-curricular oh, so because we don't Mr. Know Briner how was the first per like that was the first time I heard oh, it. So, we so I looked it up, and I looked at Holliston's policy. But Holliston doesn't actually they don't give that it. definition. Okay, so no. so, um, so I don't know how they define okay. it. Okay. So I obviously, as everyone has said, this has been probably one of the longest processes for a policy that we've gone through, and I think that. All of us are in agreement that I think what we're looking for most is what was discovered through this process is that we had a lot of inconsistency. And I think inconsistency is unfair to the, the home educated students and families, the teachers and administrators um, trying to in, administer the, the, the practice and policy. So I, I think that while whatever we end up with in terms of a policy will probably not be 100% what every party involved wanted. Um, I think that the fact that we can get that consistency, and I, I really uh, agree with Jean's point about, and then the communication that goes along with that consistency, I think is the most important. You know, we have, as a school committee and a, a district, an obligation to provide the best educational opportunities for all of the children in the district. And so weighing that up in this case is very difficult because, Dr. McLeod, as you pointed out, we're trying to provide the opportunities for those students who are home educated to access programs in our schools without providing dis undue disruption to the teachers and administrators who are also delivering that, that academic program, that educational program to the students who are in the schools. Um, that's really how I've been trying to balance this and I think like everybody at this table and probably beyond have been in five or six different places in terms of what that looks like throughout this process. I, I think that the work that you've done and that the administrative team has done has done that what I view as the best job possible to try to balance those factors in providing the best educational opportunities that we can for all of the children. Does it 
provide the best educational opportunity possible for er, the most open educational opportunity possible for every individual child maybe not but we have to look at it in the aggregate and figure out what the best balance is um, I think you, you've tried to be as accommodating as possible and I think with without that disruption and I think I, I think we really hit it I, I think that this is this is the policy that I'm comfortable um, voting to approve I'm sorry, can I make one final clarification? Because the question also was raised about um, services like OT and PT. All of that would be covered under an IEP, right? Mm -hmm. Does that work the same way, whether it the does. student is? Mm -hmm. So that's all arranged for on an individual basis with mm -hmm. those families. And so that's not something that we would provide that. Right, right. OK. So is there any more, um, I guess, comments or discussion on the policy? I guess I just want to understand if the only thing I, that I still f feel like could be enhanced on the policy, and I hate to say it because I know <laughs> this is the third reading, but I hadn't ever heard the term, like if I was part of the definition, you know, ungraded and those. I just think that that helps clarify extracurricular more. Um, especially especially in terms of some field trips and things that may be at issue because I think there are some um, assessment related pieces to things that might happen outside of the school day. So I, I think that that definition helps. Um, if, uh, um, if everyone else feels comfortable with the definition it is, that's fine. I just wanted to say that piece that I think that that helps provide a little more clarity on the definition. Well, Laurie, it would fit very nicely after the first sentence. Extracurricular is defined as programs and activities that take place outside of the regular school educational program. Um, these activities would be are ungraded, receive no academic cre credit. I mean, we could add it in right there and just put in an additional sentence. And then the final sentence would give examples. I, I personally like that idea. That's what I would recommend. Do you still have it up, the definition? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ungraded, no academic credit. Ungraded, they do not. So this is what <laughs> co-curricular activities yep. are defined by their separation from academic courses. For yep. example, they are ungraded. They do not allow students to earn academic credit. Yep. They may take place outside of school or after regular school. And they We've may, already said that. They may be operated by outside organizations. So I think that the only thing we haven't said is the first two pieces. Right. Mm -hmm. So we could just say um, extracurricular is defined as, because we're going to keep extra as opposed to co, is defined as programs and activities that take place outside of the regular school educational program are ungraded. To be ungraded, which are ungraded? I mean, that she's are, just saying, suggesting a comma, are yes, ungraded. Yes, are ungraded, yeah, and receive no academic credit. There you go. And then we can just adopt the policy as amended, As amended. Right? And then can we just take out TECA and receive? I did already. Okay, thank you. And receive no academic credit. I took out TECA, replaced it with TEC, and added Paul, um, procedure IHBGE2, information about access to listserv, et cetera. It doesn't technically exist yet. Right. No, oh. but it already but has it a snappy name. But it's got a, it's got an <laughs> identification right. number. The hardest part. So, okay, is anyone uh, ready, or does anyone want to make the motion to adopt policy IHBG as amended during, I guess, tonight's meeting? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Knight. All those in favor, is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Yes. 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 I'm a yes, it's unanimous, and so carries. And now we have our second opportunity for our public comment. Well, do we? Yep. yep. Public comment. Okay. 
I'm moving on to um, items by consensus. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the operating budget and other funds warrant number 16-016 in the amount of $142,589.28. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the middle school student activities warrant number 16-017 in the amount of $36,906.54. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the high school student activities warrant number 16-018 in the amount of $41,092.13. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve $375 from the sky's the limit fundraiser be placed in the middle school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. So moved. Seconded. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous and so carries. Um, and our next meeting on this agenda says Thursday, November 5th at 7 p.m. here in the middle school library, but we will actually um, have, we should now have a meeting posted for October 26th yes. at 7 p.m. for a special town meeting. And now I would... At the high school athletic center. At what? the high school. Oh, sorry. The high I just like to repeat that as much as possible. At okay. seven, yeah, with free babysitting. At seven, yeah, with free babysitting in the crying room. <laughs> Big signs at the middle school. The airplane <laughs> yeah. directing kind of flashers. And now I would seek a motion to enter into executive session to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel and to review executive session minutes for release. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Nickerson. Second by Ms. Knight. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Ms. Birchman? Yes. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Ms. Knight? Yes. Ms. Nickerson? Yes. And I'm a yes. I was calling me Lori last time, so it's okay. <laughs> Eight, Eight times. 23 will enter into executive session. And we're adjourning not, from that. We're adjourning from it right from and executive session. And we'll adjourn session. from executive session, yes.